let me just kind of lead you through some of the highlights of this handout. There may be some things here that you have questions on, and I'll try and, I pretty much know where a lot of these are, so I'll try to touch on a number of these for you. Remember, you always want to take the big view. You want to take an overview of what you're going to study. You don't want to just start looking at the details. You want to know how all the details fit together. So you know that we've got this handout, and there are going to be a number of things here that are going to be abbreviated just so that I can get it all in one concise page for you. Uh, make sure you don't write things and abbreviate things like I do on here. If, if I abbreviate something here, I still need you to write it out in words. Um, of course, the names are over here in this first column, and you know that this is the critical element. If you know the names of every muscle, you can get at least some credit on every question that I ask. If I ask you any of this other information on this sheet, if you can at least give me the name of the muscle, you know, and some of you were wise. On the last test, I put lots of half points on some people's tests. But it was a little bit dismaying to, to go down tests and just mark all wrong on some of those muscle questions because people didn't even know the names. Okay? Do yourself a favor. If you just don't do anything else on here, at least make sure that you can pick out the name of every muscle in any image that you're shown. And it's always a good idea to have the pictures that we use on the practical side by side with the ones on the textbooks. You can do double duty. You can get twice as much studying done if you've got both things there together when you study that. Um, you know that we're going to be uh, then studying the origins and insertions. So on the quiz next week, I can be asking names, origins, and insertions. But you get credit if you can at least give me the name. Um, when you look down the origins and insertions, again, this should all be familiar to you, or almost all of it, because these are the bone features that you know and that you're reviewing now. You know them, you're reviewing them, so you know what an intertubercular groove looks like, right? You know where the deltoid tuberosity is, uh, lesser tubercle, greater tubercle. You can pick out the clavicle. All of these things should begin to make sense to you, and... You should also note that if you know where the muscle is, if you can see the muscle individually in your mind, then most of these origins and insertions make sense. You don't need to memorize the words. Sometimes I see people, you know, on a test writing out this chart from memory. Well, that isn't going to happen when you've got a patient in, you know, in a medical situation. Right? What's more useful to you in the long run is to be able to look at a human body and say, oh, there's the biceps brachii and the brachialis is underneath it and back here's the triceps brachii. There's a little ancaneus down here in the elbow. Here's the deltoid muscle, pectoralis major. You know, just to be able to go boom, 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 boom through all of these muscles, you know, where they are and then their origins and insertions kind of make sense. Typically, there's only a couple of things. If you see a muscle runs from here to here, there's only a couple of bony features at either end of that muscle that could likely be the origin or the insertion. So, but you learn the names first, and then these come along for you. Right, then, um, if you know the names and the origins and insertions, then this action column really just comes right out of that. Now, you don't need to know this for the quiz, but you need to know it for the test. Again, the joints, like the glenohumeral joint or the cubital joint, some of the joints that you're studying, the joint names, are part of this. If a muscle crosses the joint, then that's the joint that moves during its action. You add to that the, your knowledge of flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and hopefully you could just... If you know where these are attached, if you know where the muscle is, location determines what the action is. A muscle in the front of the shoulder is probably going to do a flexing activity. A muscle in the back of the shoulder is probably going to do an extensing activity. And the joint that's moving here is the glenohumeral joint. So all of this fits together. All of this makes sense when you bring it all together. 
If you're studying bones over here and joints over here and muscles over there and they don't have any relationship, no meaning to one another, then you're just, you're just in an exercise of memorizing words. But if the bones are the attachments for the muscles and the joints are what are moving when the muscle moves, if you see the relationship between the muscles and the bones and all the rest, it begins to all reinforce one another. And the more you learn, the more you remember everything else that you need to learn. And it, it's kind of like reviewing. You're learning something new, but you're reviewing what you already know, and it just makes all of your memory stronger and better. So this, this column is going to go hand in hand with these over here. And of course, next week then, we're going to be working on this nerve column here. We'll be talking about the nerve structures that attach, but that's, that's for later. For right now, you, just, you want to get as much of this basic muscle information in as you can. And uh, as we had last time, we have these long slender columns these are the keys to the muscle chart, to the models. You can see we've got upper limb models around the room now. We're going to be using those in lab today. And if you want to say, oh, I forgot, did, did we find this cat muscle or not? Well, that's what this column right here is for, right? If it's a yes, we found it in the cat. If it's a no, then we didn't. So those are going to help you there. Now, let's just look at, look at how we laid out all of the muscles that we need to learn here. Um, when you look at the upper limb, there are four locations within the upper limb, just, just like there were in the lower limb. There's the shoulder area here, there's the upper arm, there's the forearm, and there's the hand. Now, again, I've done just like what I did before. There are muscles in the structure of the hand. I've chosen to leave that out so that we'd have more time to study the major muscles here. Shoulder, arm, and forearm. And those muscles kind of look like this. If you want to say the muscles of the shoulder, where are they? Well, they're all in this area. Muscles that come all the way down onto the rib cage here, across the chest, some of the muscle up there in the shoulder. So this, this whole area up here is naming muscles up in this part of the human body. Okay, muscles of the brachium, brachium is the term for the upper limb. Okay, so those are the muscles in this area of the muscle. And then if we turn the hand out over, we're looking at the back. These are the muscles of the antibrachium. Now take that word apart, anti, something that's anti is something that comes before, like anterior. Right, so this is the literally the forearm, right, which is this area here. So we've got muscles in three basic locations. Let's study them one at a time. They're in groups. If you look at this from the back, right, same kind of thing. Muscles of the shoulder are all up in this area. And if we take this group by group, you can see these are muscles that move the scapula. Muscles that move the scapula are here superficial and deep. They run from the vertebra here or the ribs and they run over to the scapula and they move your scapula around, right? You can raise your scapula, lower it, bring it forward, bring it back, okay? Your scapula moves by these muscles. So that, that whole group there is just positioning your scapula in your back, okay? The uh, second group here, these are muscles called the rotator cuff. Uh, if you follow any sports, you often hear about players that have injuries to their rotator cuff. It's typically like baseball pitchers, people that, that twist, sometimes tennis players trying to twist and turn their racket to put spin on a ball. So there's a, there's a small group of muscles right here on the scapula right, that attach out onto the humerus and just take this lumpy part of the humerus and rotate it this way or rotate it this way to give you that medial and lateral rotation, right? When you look at this, all of these features are on the scapula, all of these features are on the humerus. It's like up here, all of these features are on the torso, ribs and vertebra, all of these features 
are on the scapula, right? Various borders and other structures of the scapula. So you kind of, when you look at these groups, you start getting the idea, oh, yeah, the origins and the insertions, all in the body, all in the scapula, all in the scapula, all in the humerus. Now, these tend to be the deeper muscles. You don't always see every single one of these. The big trapezius muscle here is the one that's really obvious, but most of the rest of these are deep and under. And most of these muscles are then covered by these very large superficial muscles right here, right? And from the back, they would look like this, the largest muscle in the human body, the big latissimus dorsi here across the back, the shoulder muscles. These are the big showy ones. You know, if somebody goes to the gym, I'm going to work out my lats or my delts or my pecs, right? So, but notice that upper limb muscle runs all the way down to your hip, doesn't it? You've got the muscle maybe ends here, but its connective tissues run all the way down to the sacrum. So I, we're talking about upper limb up here, right? If you flip this over, right, those same muscles, this is what you see from the front. Up here in the shoulder, this is the one that gives your neck sort of that V shape here, all the way across the chest and shoulder, and muscles that come down onto the rib cage here are all responsible for moving the shoulder area. So three groups there. But this is, this is body to scapula, scapula to humerus, and then body to humerus, right? Bypassing the scapula, they go right from the body all the way over to the humerus itself. These are the muscles that move the humerus. If you watch gymnastics, if you saw the Olympics, um, right, the, the things that the, the male gymnasts do, you know, with holding onto the rings and all of that. It's these big muscles that are going right from the body all the way out to the humerus, and then they're moving their humerus. They're actually holding on with their hands and moving their body in various ways. But it's, it's these big, broad muscles here that are, that are mostly responsible for that. Now, that's, that's the muscle in the shoulder area, three groups there. Down here in the brachium, right, now there's just two groups. There's just basically an anterior group and a posterior group, and there's only two muscles in each. So this is pretty simple, right? These, these muscles come from the humerus or even up onto the shoulder a little bit and then come down onto the forearm. And these are all, if you looked at the function, these are flexors right here. Right? If you look at the back, then this posterior group is going to be in the same exact place. Right? And these come from the, the humerus or even up onto the shoulder. And notice all of these are the same insertion, aren't they? They all come down to the olecranon process. Okay, on the forearm, on the antebrachium then, we've got four groups here. Four groups, but the groups are really logical here. Okay, these are the anterior muscles. You can see there's four groups. This is all anterior. This is the anterior compartment here. This one is the deep compartment, and some of the muscles in the deep area are on the front, some are on the back. And this, this lateral compartment, there's one muscle that we'll point out in a minute that's interesting there. If you turn this around then on the back, same thing, posterior, there's a whole compartment of posterior muscles here, right? And then some of this deep compartment, one of these deep muscles in this, is in this area. And that uh, brachioradialis muscle is an interesting one. We'll point that out in more detail in a minute. Okay, so this is kind of how it's all laid out, right? Lots of anterior, posterior stuff here as you get down into the limb. Shoulder's a little more complicated than the hip was. Um, as you look through origins and insertions, there may be a few little items here that you're not familiar with. Like I want to point one out right here, um, and it has to do with the trapezius muscle. Do you see the trapezius muscle in this list of muscles that move the shoulder. It looks like this. Um, if you know what a trapezoid is, it's usually got two parallel lines and then sloped shoulders. So not, it's kind of like a rectangle that you tip the sides in. 
So if you have both trapezius muscles, you have something that looks like a child's kite, right? The trapezius muscle uh, originates right here, and one of its origins is called the nuchal ligament. And I wanted to make sure that we, we saw what that is. If you look at the rest of it, you know where the skull is, and you can see that some of the muscle comes all the way up to the skull. You probably know the C7, T12, right? C7, T12, C7 vertebra would be the last cervical one, and then all the thoracics, all the way down to T12 here. But what's going on in the neck area? Here there's an, something called the nuchal ligament. And the nuchal ligament is way out here at the surface of the neck. What you have to notice about the neck area is that the vertebra are actually pushed deep into the neck area. Look at the skeleton over here for a minute. If you look at the thoracic area, you can see that the vertebra are right on the surface, aren't they? You can run your finger down somebody's back and feel the bony lumps, can't you? But not so much in the neck area, right? If you look at the tissues here and around the neck, do you see where the bones are? Are they way out and back here where I can feel them? No, why are they pressed so deep into the neck? Why, why would the vertebra be here and not back out here where my hand is? It's balance, isn't it? Right, I got this great big heavy skull up here, and if I had the vertebra out and back, this thing would be falling forward all the time, right? So the neck vertebra are pressed deep into the center so that the skull balances nicely over them. Now, what that means is any muscle out here in the back of the neck is not really attached right into the vertebra. And the way that the neck area is built is you're built with this. The bones are in here, but there's a sheet of connective tissue, and there is a cord, there's a rope of connective tissue running down the back called the nuchal ligament. In an x-ray, it looks like this, right? You see that you can see the cervical vertebra here, and this outline here is some very, very dense connective tissue in a cord running down the neck there. So that's, that's the nuchal ligament. You can always tell where it runs to. The C7 vertebra is the prominent vertebra here at the back of your neck. Run your fingers down the back of your neck, and when you get to the base of your neck, you should feel a bony lump sticking out. Can you feel that? Right? That bony lump is the C7 vertebra. Every good anatomy student should know that. That's the C7 vertebra, is that big bony lump at the base of your neck in the back. And so that nuchal ligament is attached to the skull up here, and then it's attached down here onto the C7 vertebra. So make sure you understand that. When you, when you go to look at the trapezius, you want to know that nuchal ligament. Okay? Okay. All right, <clears throat> let's, let's look at the other end of trapezius too. That's the origin there. The trapezius has three insertions, and these are going to come into play in our dissection today. Let's look at trapezius in a little more detail. Right? If you look at the picture like we have up there, or if you look at the actual back, you can see, you can see the outline here of trapezius. Right, would be right there in a person's back. You can see it like it is there. <clears throat> the origin is running down the center there with the nuchal ligament, the C7 to T12 vertebra. <clears throat> the insertion is distal clavicle acromion spine, and you can see it right here in the picture. The scapula is kind of turned, but here's the spine of the scapula. The end of the spine of the scapula is the acromion, right? And then the muscle even laps over onto part of the clavicle. So this big trapezius muscle has what we consider to be three origins and three insertions. Okay, three origins and three insertions. Now, from this spot, you should see another muscle Right? Do you see another muscle attached to that same area? What other big muscle is attached there? 
Yeah, I see the exact same thing right here, don't I? If I come down here, what's this muscle? The deltoid muscle, right? This distal clavicle acromion spine is the origin, right? This is the insertion of this muscle, but this becomes the origin of the deltoid. Deltoid and trapezius work hand in hand in moving the arm. Right? And that's, that's the deltoid then right there. You know where the name comes from, right? <clears throat> from delta, you know what delta is? It's a triangle. In, in the Greek alphabet, instead of writing a D, if you're writing things in Greek, you write a triangle for the letter D. And, you know, there's like river deltas. It's where the river comes to the ocean and the water spreads out and you get a triangle as the silt and everything spreads out. They have airplanes that are deltas. They're basically flying triangles. Right? So this is the deltoid muscle because it does have this, you can see the triangular nature of the muscle. It all goes into one insertion. Does everybody know that insertion? Yeah. You should. What is it? Yeah, the deltoid tuberosity, of course, right? It's right up there, right? Can you see how that all goes into a point? It just goes right into the deltoid tuberosity there. So these, <clears throat> this one's especially important here. Not hard to remember because all three objects are here together. You're going to see this in the cat today too. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at a couple of other muscles here. Um, the, the big muscles like deltoid and latissimus dorsi, pectoralis major, these are the big muscles over the shoulder. They have a variety of origins, but notice that there's a single set of insertions here, which is called the intertubercular groove. Does everybody know where the intertubercular groove is on the bone? Right? And that little groove actually has two lips. If you've got a little trench, you've got two lips or edges on the edge of the trench, don't you? Right? And if you look closely right here, right, you can see all these muscles, one, two, three muscles, all coming together in around the edge of the bicep here. In fact, the bicep, one of the tendons of the bicep muscle runs in that intertubercular groove. The bicep tendon runs right through that groove. And so you see muscles attaching on either side of the bicep right here. Um, this right here is the pectoralis major, right, coming across the chest. It goes into this more medial lip. I should say the more lateral lip. It's reaching all the way across. Then here is latissimus dorsi. Right? This is the big muscle coming up under the armpit from behind. Right? Its partner is the teres major, and it's the one right here side by side with it. So if you look at these two muscles and this muscle, all three of them are coming into the edges of the intertubercular groove. So that's... That's an easy way to put these, at least the insertion of those three muscles together. Hopefully that helps. All right. Okay. Now let's, um, let's look at the bicep muscle. Okay, the bicep muscle, which is up in the arm, and the brachialis muscle. These are the two muscles in the arm. And as you might guess, they're going to attach down into the forearm. And when you look at the bicep muscle here, this is why I wanted you to call this the bicipital tuberosity. On the radius over here, there's a little bit of link into the skin here, but the major insertion is right down here. That's why that lump is as big as it is, because your bicep muscle pulls on the radius right at that bicipital tuberosity. Some of you are calling it radial tuberosity. I guess that's okay. But I like it that it indicates that. I like, I like to use bicipital tuberosity because it reinforces. The partner to this, the brachialis, 
is going to attach onto the ulna, onto the coracoid process. So notice I've got two muscles here, one to the radius and one to the ulna. So both bones get pulled at the same time when you flex the forearm there. On the posterior side, down here, the triceps brachii and its partner and caneus, they all have the same insertion, one insertion for the whole bit. And of course, is right down here, the olecranon process. All of this, and it's the pulling. There's your olecranon. This muscle is pulling, right, to get the extension here. I always think it's interesting to stop and think, Muscles only pull, don't they? Right? The only thing that actinomyosin can do is contract, shorten. So how do I get a push? If all my muscles can only pull, how can I push? <laughs> Not relaxing. I don't get a push from relaxing. I've got force behind it. Right? It's mechanical leverage, isn't it? The bones are put together like my forearm here is really teeter-tottering around my humerus, isn't it? And it's only the fact that part of my ulna sticks way out here that I can pull the ulna, which results in a push or an extension of my forearm, right? It's pulling the, ulna, pulling the olecranon process that extends my arm and gives me a push. It's, it's the mechanical leverage of the skeleton that allows some muscles to pull, but the bones will push. Okay, so these are some of the highlights here. The, the origins, I think, are always harder than, than the insertions. If I was studying this, I'd probably go right to some of the real common insertions over here and make sure I understood those, and then I'd come over here and see if I could pick up as many origins as I could. Okay, if we look back here on the forearm, this is the antebrachium area. Um, there are a couple of bits of connective tissue here that you should highlight. We did this before, right? The interosseous membrane is sometimes part of the origins here, right? You know this interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna. Um, when you look at where this usually is, it's the pollicis muscles, isn't it? You remember the term pollicis? Right. My thumb is my pollux, and the adjective for anything belonging to my thumb is pollicis. So whenever you see, if you're going to write the origin for a pollicis muscle, always include the interosseous membrane there. Right. The other piece of connective tissue, there's just one other one that you should be familiar with. It's called the palmar aponeurosis, and it's just where it says it is in the palm of your hand, right? Here's the palm of the hand, and there's a muscle here, and it's actually called a palmar muscle, and it connects down here into a sheet of connective tissue. An aponeurosis is a tendon that's in a sheet, it's a sheet-like piece of muscle that connects down into the palm of the hand, and it's part of just pulling the palm of the hand toward the arm, flexing your wrist joint. So there's just three pieces of connective tissue here, right, that you should really know by name, that nuchal ligament, make sure you know the interosseous membrane, and then this palmar aponeurosis as well. Okay. The rest of the forearm here, um, let's take it in groups and just look at how this lays out. Especially, again, especially the insertions. Almost every one of these names here will tell you exactly what this is if you know what you're doing. If you've memorized the name, you can get almost every insertion in the forearm from the name. Now look at this. Let's look down here. I'm going to go from the bottom up. Look at the flexors here, right? Flexor muscles are in this group. Where are the flexor muscles? Okay, think about what, what movement here. The muscles here in my forearm connect down into my hand, into various parts of my hand. What flexing things can I do here? I can do this, right? I can flex my wrist. 
I can flex my fingers at my knuckles. I can flex the fingers themselves. And where would all of those muscles be that would be doing that? In the back or the front? In the front, right? This is the anterior compartment. All of my muscles here are basically flexors. If I point to one of these muscles here, what's the first word you're going to write on your answer sheet? Flexor, of course, right? Now, the only one that isn't is this big lateral muscle. When you, when you get this together in your head, the first thing that you want to do is make sure you can identify brachioradialis because you can see it from both sides and it's always here on the lateral side. It's always on the lateral side. So these are all flexors, and they're all in the anterior compartment. Now let's flip it over now. If you look on the other side, okay, this is the back side of the hand. All the muscles here are extensor muscles. If I point to any one of these, if you can see this is the back of the hand, and I point to one of these, what's the first word you're going to write? Extensor, right? You're going to write extensor. The third group here, going from bottom up, are the deep muscles, and these are the muscles that do the rotating action here. We've talked about this before, how my forearm can rotate. That's this. These are deep. Um, and so you've got to have some cutaway pictures to see most of these. Um, these are what we're going to call rotators. There are special names here, though, for rotation. You should write these down. When you rotate so that you go palm down, that's called pronation. Pronation. It's kind of like the word prone. If you put somebody in a prone position, you put them face down. If you're in PE class and they say assume the prone position, it's usually a push-up position, face down. Supine is face up. I take the palm of my hand to be the face, right? And so if I'm rotating palm down, I'm pronating. If I'm rotating palm up, I'm supinating. And you can see that every muscle in this group is either called a pronator or a supinator. Right? So the names tell you what they're doing. And when you get the position of the bones and all the rest, you'll start going, oh, the supinator is in the back, the pronators are in the front. It all begins to make sense. Of course, the um, biggie here is this brachioradialis, and it's always best to be able to pick it out. Whichever side of the arm you're on, find the lateral side, this is an elbow flexor, by the way. Find the lateral side, and you'll find the muscle. <clears throat> What's so interesting about this, all of these muscles work on the forearm or the hand. The only muscle in the forearm that doesn't is this one because it inserts on the radius. It never gets across to the hand. It runs from the humerus to the radius. The only joint it crosses is your elbow. So this one muscle in your forearm is really working like your bicep muscle does, only it's down here. Only joint it crosses is the cubital joint, so it's an elbow flexor. It's not like any of the others here, right? And that's, that's this muscle here. And the key is to always remember this is on the lateral side. If you're seeing any, any picture of a forearm, the first muscle to the lateral side is always the bra brachioradialis, and then everything else you would name flexor this and flexor that. If you're on the extensor side, the first lateral muscle, how will you know the lateral from the medial side of the arm? What's, what's the big, big clue? Your thumb, exactly. I'm hearing you say that. The thumb in the anatomical position is always pointing lateral. So the muscle on the thumb side is always brachioradialis. Once you do that, then you say flexor here or extensor on the posterior side, and you've got a good start to naming any of these muscles. Now, if you look in a little more detail here, as I said before, we're going to take the hand now because these flexor muscles, these extensor muscles, all anchor into the hand. 
The first word in any of these is either extensor or flexor, isn't it? You've got word one in any of these. I had to abbreviate here to get some of these in. The little letter E, of course, is extensor. Now, the second letter, the, I'm sorry, the second word tells you what the muscle attaches to. Let's look at the second word here, okay? The little C here stands for carpi. You can see I had room to spell it out in a couple of places here. So if it's extensor carpi or flexor carpi, what do you think it attaches to? Carpals, right? That's what you would guess, except that the carpals are a little too small, a little too slippery and slidey against each other. What else has a carpal in its name? Metacarpals, exactly, right? These muscles are going to just go across your wrist joint, aren't they? So an extensor carpi or a flexor carpi is just going to do what? Are they going to move your fingers? If I don't attach to a finger, I can't move a finger, can I? Right? So if, if the muscle just runs to here, and these, you're right, these are going to go to the metacarpals. Notice that every one of these have metacarpal as an attachment, right? And it's these three. It's always second, third, or fifth, right? And these are just going to cross and cause flexing or extending of the radiocarpal joint, metacarpals. Right? And the actual attachment points are right down here at the base. And where you have three carpies in the extensor side, second, third, and fifth, down here in the flexor side where you've got just two, second and third would be on one muscle, and the fifth is on its own. So that lays out if the word, second word is carpi, or if you know that it attaches to a metacarpal, that's what the carpi term is, and it's working this radiocarpal joint. Now, what if the muscle says digi something? What if it says digitorum, digiti, digitorum? I had to abbreviate that, but what, what does that go to? Fingers, exactly. So see how the name tells you where it goes? Flexor digitorum is going to flex the fingers. Extensor digitorum is going to straighten the fingers. Right, so where do these attach? Okay, what joints are they going to work? Well, they're going to work the interphalangeal joints, aren't they? They're going to work the interphalangeal joints. And if you look here, phalanges, phalanx, phalanx, phalanges. If it's digitorum, that's plural, so it's all fingers, two through five. If it's digiti, what finger would that be? Right? Digitorum, it's going to be out to the distal phalanx of all the fingers so that it can pull all the joints. Right? But what if it's digiti minimi? What would that be? Yeah, your little finger, right? Your pinky. Right? This is the one you use when you drink tea with the Queen of England. They've got these little tiny teacups so you can't get all your fingers. So you're little finger. Have you ever noticed how straight that finger can be? Right? You can straighten that so you can keep all your other fingers in here and you can straighten that very nicely. It's not easy to do that with other fingers. You have to open up the rest of your fingers to straighten other ones. But this one can be straight even when all the other ones are in the palm of your hand. That's because you've got a, you've got a muscle that's attached. Uh, let's see. Yeah, see, it's attached all the way out here on the proximal phalanx here. So it just pulls this proximal phalanx and straightens everything else. You've got a second muscle that will do this extensor indices. That comes from the, that's where we get the word index finger. Anybody know which finger is your index finger? Some of you? Right. Finger number two. This is the one you use to point with. You punch a telephone, you know, telephone buttons or... You know, if you've got to push the buttons on the microwave, most of us use finger number two for that because it's got a special muscle that straightens it. Right? So extensor indices goes to, and again, it's the same sort of thing right here to the base of the second finger. So these two fingers are meant to be straightened. There's, there's a lesson in this, right? What does that say? 
I love you. Come on, everybody, doesn't everybody know that? Or how's it, how's it, bro? No, that's this one, right? Oh, I love you, right? None of the other fingers here are meant to be straightened all on their own. Okay? All right. You've got, you've got muscles to straighten these. You're not supposed to straighten any of the other fingers. All right, but those, you can see what those are attached. So, again, this should be logical. If it's digi something, it's going to a phalanx, right? Carpi muscles are going to metacarpals. How about the other one here? Pollicis goes to thumb. And so what's it going to be over here? It's going to be the phalanx, right? The bones that make up your thumb here are the phalanges. There's only two of them. And I, I really like this on the extensor muscles. Look at the two extensor pollicis. One's called longus, one's called brevis. So one, the longus, wouldn't you guess if it's going to go to which one of these two? Which would be the longer one? Which would be the farther one? Right? Yeah, so you've got an attachment out here onto the distal phalanx. The brevis, you've got an attachment here to the proximal phalanx. Look at the origins, though. Interosseous membrane is included, but one goes to the radius, and one is attached over to the ulna. Now, this is so simple, because all you have to do is say, if it's a longest muscle, what would it connect from and to? What's the longest distance? From the ulna to the distal phalanx, right? What's the shorter distance? From the radius to the proximal phalanx, and that's exactly what you see here. The longest is ulna to distal. The brevis is radius to the proximal phalanx. Now, the flexor here isn't quite that logical. You gotta, the flexors are a little more odd, but everything in the extensor muscles is so, so logical. It just works. Okay, last couple of things here. The origins here. The origins here are going to be simpler than they are in many other places. If you look closely, you'll see something common, something repetitious in the extensors and something repetitious in the flexors. Do you see it? What do we have here? Yeah. The majority of these extensor muscles have a common origin. Do you know where that lateral epicondyle is? And you pick it out up here? Right? Yeah, that lateral epicondyle, it turns out, is a common site for the extensor muscles to be attached to. Now, if you look closely here, can't you see how all of these extensor muscles seem to be going into one spot? That one little spot there is the lateral epicondyle. And it doesn't matter what picture you look at. If you look at the models around the room, you can always see these extensor, these posterior muscles, all tend, all attach over onto the lateral epicondyle. In fact, we've got it, we use a term for this. We call this the common extensor origin. Isn't that a great test question? Which bony feature is the common extensor origin for the forearm? right? It's the lateral epicondyle. Guess what it is for the flexor muscles then? Medial epicondyle. The majority of these, right, are medial epicondyle. Okay, you know where that medial, the medial epicondyle is big. You know, sometimes people confuse these. Do you know how to remember which one is which, right? Which is stronger, your flexing activity or your extensing? Are you, is this stronger or is this stronger? Grabbing something, right, is stronger. These are your flexor muscles. So they get the bigger epicondyle, don't they? The stronger muscles get the bigger epicondyle. The medial epicondyle is much larger than the lateral. So you can kind of keep things straight with that. If you look at a pic picture of the flexor muscles here, there's brachioradialis. That's its own thing. But if you look at all the flexors, they're all coming this way, right? They're all coming over to the medial side of the humerus. They're all attaching into the medial epicondyle, 
right? And so what do we call the medial epicondyle? It's the common, common flexor origin, medial epicondyle. So you just keep this in mind. If you don't remember any origins and I'm pointing to an extensor muscle, <laughs> right? Lateral epicondyle. If I'm pointing to a flexor muscle and you don't remember any origins, at least write medial epicondyle. Give it a shot, okay? That's your best chance of being right on this. And you can kind of remember, see the exceptions are the thumb and first finger here. The exception down here is basically the thumb is always an exception to these because the thumb goes out sideways, so you can't attach a thumb muscle way up this far. It can't go down and turn the corner. The thumb muscles are always attached in here at the distal end of the forearm. Okay? So that's, that's a key feature, too, in learning these muscles. Um, last couple of things. Uh, this may be the easiest group of muscles here to remember, this rotator cuff. Remember I said they all come from the scapula to the humerus, right? And if you look at the names, right, supraspinatus, what's its origin? Supraspinous fossa, right? What's the infraspinatus muscle? Infras See how they're named for what they are, subscapularis? Subscapular fossa. These two are on the posterior side, right? You know your three fossas? There's a muscle sitting in all three fossas, and the fossas are their origins. And even the insertions are not too tough, right? The, the muscles attach out here onto the humerus. What are the lumpy parts of the humerus at the proximal end here? The tubercles, aren't they, right? These three muscles all attach to the greater tubercle. Right? If you look at the posterior shoulder, here's those three muscles. You see them going into the humerus here. Do you know where the lesser tubercle is? It's in front, isn't it? So if I'm coming from behind, what's the first tubercle I come to? The greater tubercle, right? So these are all on the greater. Subscapulus here is on the anterior shoulder, right? It's the deep side, the anterior side of the bone, right? When it comes out from under, what's the lump that it's closest to? Lesser tubercle. So it's kind of logical, too. If you know where the muscles are, these reach the greater tubercle. This one reaches the lesser tubercle. This may be the easiest group ever to learn origins and insertions for because they, they fit so well. They're so logical. Okay, so you've got... Um, oh, one, this, I often get questions on this. I've abbreviated the joint names here, right? You see IP, MP, and uh, I've, got, I've actually got distal in there. Do I have P? Where's PIP? Oh, down here. Did I highlight these two? Right. Proximal IP, distal IP. I want to make sure you know what those joints are in the hand, right? MP is metacarpophalangeal, right? MP is going to be metacarpophalangeal, the joints at the knuckles between the fingers and the hand. So again, this should make lots of sense to you. If a muscle attaches to the metacarpals, it's going to move the radiocarpal joint. If it goes all the way out past these joints, like especially that extensor indices and extensor digiti minimi, those muscles are going to move the MP joint, right? If it says just IP, like any of these thumb, thumb features, because there's only one of each. Oh, I put those in. Okay. Trying to move this along. Right, so muscles that attach here would only cross this metacarpal phalangeal, so they would work that joint. The IP, the interphalangeal, is like here, especially in the thumb, there's only one. There's only one interphalangeal joint, so we simply call it interphalangeal. And, but in the fingers, notice that there are two joints, aren't there? Right? In your fingers, you have a proximal interphalangeal, so that'll be the proximal IP. 
distal interphalangeal, the distal, because I got two interphalangeal joints in each of my fingers, two through five, so I have to distinguish those. All right. Okay, so those, those are places, those are tips and just little tricks for working on the